Little Rock High School. Dan Lassiter planned on using me as a prostitute to entertain his friends, unquote. At the time, Lassiter was 40, more than twice her age. She was told by one of Lassiter's cohorts that, quote, if I ever betray his trust and hurt Lassiter in any way, I would not see daylight to tell about it anymore, unquote. She said she met Bill Clinton several times, but he was never acting like a governor when I saw him. She claims to have witnessed Governor Clinton taking cocaine on several occasions. In an interview with U.S. attorneys, a 33-year-old Little Rock woman stated that she had been started on cocaine by an associate of Lassiter's. He warned her that she was as good as dead if she ever told anything about him or Lassiter. As a circuit court clerk, Dennis Patrick's income was less than $25,000. Dan Lassiter's brokerage company would secretly run over $100 million through Dennis's account. When the FBI found out, they informed Dennis that he would be an important witness in their investigation of Whitewater. The ATF soon learned that Dennis's life was in danger and informed him that a contract was out on his life. It was then that he began wearing a bulletproof vest. After two attempts on his life, the police arrested a man who admitted that he had been contracted for $20,000 to kill Dennis Patrick and his wife. Patsy Thomason was given power of attorney to manage Lassiter's business empire while he was in prison. An employee at Lassiter's firm told Dennis that Thomason was in charge and that she could put an end to his nightmare. But the nightmare continued and Dennis was stripped of his life, his name, his integrity, everything he had. He eventually fled the state for his safety as well as that of his family. Patsy Thomason was clearly a favorite of Bill Clinton. He appointed her executive secretary of the Arkansas Democratic Party, which helped build the foundations for his presidential bid. After the 1992 elections, she was given one of the most powerful positions in Washington, director of the White House Office of Administration. In this position, Thomason failed to provide proper security clearances for over 100 White House staff members many of whom were alleged drug users. Under her direction, random drug testing for the White House staff was eliminated. Poultry tycoon Don Tyson heavily financed Bill Clinton's election campaigns throughout his career. In return, he received millions of dollars in state tax breaks, as well as favorable treatment in the form of relaxed environmental regulations. Under Clinton, the chicken industry effectively made its own rules in Arkansas. Hillary's amazing $100,000 profit from an initial $1,000 investment was made possible through the influence of Tyson Foods counselor James Blair. After this incident, the relationship between the Clintons and Tyson Foods president Don Tyson came under examination. The resulting revelations were shocking indeed, as evidenced by the following documents from the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency, which linked Don Tyson to drug trafficking. One file cited an informant who said Tyson was involved in drug traffic and stolen property. Another stated that Tyson's company aircraft was being utilized to smuggle drugs from Florida to Springdale, Arkansas. A memorandum on July 19, 1988, is centered on Don Tyson's illegal use and distribution of cocaine. It calls for a combined investigation team of FBI, DEA, IRS, and the state police. There were documents that referred to alleged hitmen employed by Tyson to kill drug dealers who owed him money. In one of them, an informer stated that Daddy Don, Donald Tyson, can put out the word to take care of you. She gave as an example a female who was found in a culvert near Highway 71 outside of Fayetteville, Arkansas. One woman stated that she was afraid that she might get killed as she understood that Don Tyson was a drug dealer who brought drugs in from California by truck and airplanes. And a confidential informant claimed to have information on an alleged hitman for Don Tyson. None of the allegations against Don Tyson have led to criminal charges. Police officers who tried to mount a case against Tyson 
were destroyed by their superiors in the state police. Mena, Arkansas is tucked away in the remote Washita Mountains of western Arkansas. It became the site of one of the most enduring conspiracy theories of the late 20th century. The core allegation is that the airport was used to transport weapons to the Nicaraguan Contras, with collusion and cover-up implicating Governor Bill Clinton. It was a multi-billion dollar gun running, drug smuggling, and money laundering operation. Barry Steele was a legend in the cocaine trade. His drug runs were flown in from Latin America, loads averaging 300 pounds of cocaine and worth at least tens of millions of dollars, and parachuted onto remote sites in Arkansas. By the sheer magnitude of the drugs and money its flights generated, tiny Mena, Arkansas became in the 1980s one of the world centers of the narcotics trade and the base of what many believed was the single largest cocaine smuggling operation in U.S. history. Larry Douglas Brown was Bill Clinton's favorite among the troopers assigned as his personal bodyguards. Brown gave hundreds of pages of testimony under oath and supporting documentation that the governor had clearly been aware of the arms and drug running out of Mena as early as 1984. The state trooper watched in despair while the governor did nothing about it. In October of 1984, Barry Seal and Brown had lunch at Cajun's Wharf in Little Rock, a popular restaurant in the Arkansas River Bottoms. In conversations over the next few weeks, Seal casually referred to Clinton as the Gov and acted like he knew the governor, Brown recalled. By the summer of 1985, Seal became a scapegoat and was sentenced to a halfway house in Baton Rouge. It was there that assassins found him and gunned him down in his white Cadillac on a rainy February night in 1986. IRS agent Bill Duncan and state police detective Russell Welch had compiled a mammoth investigative file on the Mina operation. The material became part of an eventual 35-volume, 3,000-page Arkansas State Police archive a meticulous presentation of the Mina case for a grand jury. However, the cases were effectively suppressed. Duncan and Welts were not even called to testify before grand juries, state or federal. Duncan and Welch watched the Mina inquiry systematically quashed and their own careers destroyed as the IRS and state police effectively disavowed their investigations. On the night of August 23, 1987, just outside the little town of Alexander, Arkansas, Kevin Ives, 17, and Don Henry, 16, witnessed a cocaine drop, which was part of the drug smuggling operation in Mena, Arkansas. The boys were captured and their hands were tied behind their backs. They were kicked and beaten and finally executed. One of the boys was stabbed to death. The bodies were wrapped in a tarpaulin and placed across the railway tracks to be mangled by the next train. The Arkansas medical examiner, Fami Malik, ruled the deaths an accident. He said the boys had smoked marijuana joints and had fallen into a trance on the railway tracks side by side. As the facts would later show, the crime lab never tested the concentration of marijuana in their blood. They were told to back Malik's ruling. Bill Clinton was the only person to whom the crime lab answered. Kevin Ives' mother, Linda, created such a stir that a grand jury was called to investigate the case. The bodies were exhumed, and a second autopsy was conducted by the Atlanta Medical Examiner.